Shall we start? Okay. Okay, let's get started. Uh, my name is Kathy Zhang. I'm a principal architect at Huawei Silicon Valley Center. Uh, my name is Paul Carver. I'm principal member of technical staff at AT&T. My name is Ralf Tzitzerg. I'm an architect at Deutsche Telekom caring about data center networks. Uh, so today we are going to go through the following topic. First, we are going to uh, introduce what is survey chain, and then we are going to talk about what problems the survey chain solve. And then we are go going to give a brief introduction on the OpenStack survey chain solution. And later we are going to kind of deep dive into some examples of uh, survey chain uses scenario. After that, we are going to summarize the benefit of the new OpenStack survey chain solution. And at the end, we are going to give our project information and do a demo. So how many people know what is survey chain? Raise your hand. Okay, very good. Oh. Okay, so by survey chain, what we mean here is through a centralized OpenStack-based survey chain management and control platform, and different, um, different tenants flows can be automatically provisioned to go through different sequences of service functions. So service functions include like NAT, firewall, intrusion detection service, video optimizer, load balancer, etc. So these service functions can run on the VM or run on container or run on the physical box. Yeah. A, a service function chain generally just consists of several what we call virtual network functions. These can be things like firewalls, load balancers, or they can be more specialized things. So from my perspective, um, coming from AT&T, we're very interested in telco functions, and we're not going to get into the details of what those are in this talk, but we have a, a need to provision a flow of traffic that goes through a variety of very specialized applications. And these applications are generally doing Multiple, func multiple functions, packet handling functions, whether it's security, caching, and other things. And we have to handle a large amount of traffic. So what we've illustrated here in this diagram is a, a flow of traffic is not something that we can simply pass through a load balancer on a VM because a flow of traffic is many tens or hundreds of gigabits per second. It's not as simple as I'm going to spin up a, a load balancer and run that on a VM and run all my traffic through that VM and let that VM load balance other VMs. We need to direct the traffic at the network layer in order to have the capacity, and we need to be able to scale that out. This is the, the same picture, but I, what we've shown here is that each of these functions, VNF 1, 2, and 3, virtual network function 1, 2, and 3, is really consisting of multiple virtual machines. And at each hop in the chain, those virtual machines may be doing different amounts of CPU work, and therefore we may need more instances at one hop than we need at another, and we need to be able to scale those into independently, and we need to be able to force the traffic to go through consistent paths through these service chains, because some of these service functions may be stateful and may need to, may need to see both sides of a flow. So we, we may need to, a, a consistency where one flow passes through, as just shown here, the first VM in the first function, the second VM in the second function, the first VM in the third, a different flow of traffic flows through a, a different pattern. Now, a number of uh, AT&T people have, have spoken about our initiative called Domain 2.0, and this is, um, to us, this is the problem that service function chaining helps us address we have published a white paper on this domain 2.0 strategy and what you see here are just a selection of physical network functions. We have historically engineered these boxes into the network using cabling, physical cabling between the boxes to make the traffic go the way we want. Sometimes we substitute VLANs and just provision VLANs around from box one to box two and then back to box or to box three and our domain 2.0 vision is really about migrating from physical to virtual. Well, we can't do that if the virtual network doesn't have the constructs that the physical network does. 
Uh, we also use the term policy-based routing. So anyone from a network background will know what that means. If you're not from a network background, you can think of policy-based routing in simplest terms is any time when you want to direct traffic on something other than the destination IP address. Directing traffic to a destination is easy. Any time you want to direct traffic based on other criteria and, and control the flow so it goes other than where the destination IP address would imply, that's policy-based routing. And that, again, service function chaining allows us to address that problem. If we can't fit the traffic to the, the physical network topology, we're out of luck. So uh, I'm going <laughs> to go to the other slide. I don't want to talk too much about that slide. But um, real quickly, the way we used to do these things is Network diagrams, Visio is, is a big part of that. Spreadsheets showing cabling plans or VLAN plans, how it is all going to be ori organized. Um, run books or network description documents, long, lengthy documents describing in laborious detail how to configure each piece of equipment so that the traffic goes the way we want. Emails, ad infinitum, discussing it. PowerPoint presentation to explain to people how it all works. And then these documents get passed around people to implement. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. So to solve the uh, problems which Paul just described, uh, and the networking SFC project was initiated in OpenStack Neutron. So with this project, through a few API calls, then you know the service chain can be automatically set, set up and the search chain paths can be automatically provisioned. So the API, I will not go into very detail on how the whole model works and the API detail, because we have another session at 5.30. Um, we'll deep dive into the architecture, the technical details. And so here I'm go just going to give a, a very high level uh, introduction. So the API consists of two parts. One part is flow classifier. Basically, we need to specify you, uh, you know what um, flows will go through this chain. There could be multiple flows that associate with this chain. So multiple flow go through the same chain. Then there will be multiple flow classifiers. The other part is a sequence, an ordered sequence of port pair groups. So by that, each port pair group is a group of functional-like service functions. For example, if we want uh, on the bottom, it shows this chain. If you if we want uh, a traffic to go first go through IPS and then firewall and then video optimizer, then we need to specify a port pair group for the IPS, a port pair group for the firewall, and port pair group for the video optimizer. So, for example, if we have two IPS uh, service VMs providing IPS service, then this IPS port pair group will consist of two. IPS service VMs so that the traffic can be automatically load balanced to the uh, to the specific IPS. Uh, same for the uh, port pair group, uh, firewall port pair group, and uh, video optimizer port pair group. So here is you know um, the API calls. There are four API to set up the chain. So the first API is create. Uh, it's, it's called Neutron Port Pair Create. Basically, you we we need to create a port pair for each uh, service function. For example, uh, if it's a firewall service function, we need to create a port pair for that for firewall service function. We need to specify its ingress neutron port and egress neutron port of that service function. And then after that, we need to create the port pair group. And this port pair group can include one or more port pairs uh, with each port pair corresponding to our service function. So this group, the functional like service function together. And then we need to specify the uh, flow classifier. And we have, there are two ways to specify the flow classifiers. One is you specify the n tuple of the flows. It could be five tuple, seven tuple. And another way to specify the flow classifier is, you know, you specify the, the neutron ports, the, the source neutron port and destination neutron port. Or you can just specify one neutron port, one source neutron port. So what that means is any traffic that originating from that neutron port will go through this chain. If you just specify destination neutron port, that means any traffic that exit that neutron port will go through this chain. 
uh, of course, you can specify, you know, source and destination. That means the traffic goes through these two ports or goes through the chain. So after that, then we uh, create the port chain. In this port chain, we specify the sequence of port pair groups. Uh, in the creation of port chain, you can specify a flow class file, or you do not need. If you don't specify a flow class file, this chain will be created, but it will not be active. And later, you can associate one or more flows to this chain by update this port chain. Again, we're going to talk about this in more detail um, in, the, in another session. Okay. So uh, now we have heard a lot of theory and how the model looks like. Um, let's look now at some examples. So now, uh, first an example from the old world. Assume that you are running a web server and you want to place, for example, security in front of it, an IPS and a firewall. Everybody knows may maybe what that means if you have a physical data center. You need to bring in devices, you need to create VLANs, you have a lot of actions to do. So if you're talking to a network administrator, okay, you have to create VLANs, you have to connect firewall and the IPS, you have to connect the firewall to the segment where the web server is. And at the end, you have to reconnect the router to another VLAN so that the traffic can flow from the router to, the, to your web server. So that costs a lot of time, is very inflexible. Yeah, you need to hope that everything works as expected because the fallback costs really a lot of time. There are other ways to insert such service functions in the old world, like Paul mentioned it, you can use policy routing, for example. And what's really missing, you cannot select on the traffic that should go through such a, ser such a service chain. So these devices, yeah, they are a bump in the wire, and they help you to, to solve your problem, but they don't help you how to speed that up. So with the proposed model of the service chaining API, the same stuff can be done with a neutron, but in a much more flexible way. Instead of putting the devices directly into the, connect, into the path between the router and the web server, you are creating a path besides. And you can select the traffic that passes on, on the uh, uh, lower side through the IPS and the firewall. So in new, if, if you take the OpenStack Neutron approach, okay, you create, like Casey showed it on the OpenStack API stuff, you create neutron ports, you create the port pairs, which specify the ingress and egress for each service function. You create port pair groups. I will come on the next slide for that. Yeah, you need to boot your firewall and your IPS. You should create your classifier that classifies traffic that should pass through the service chain. And at the end, there you create the port chain which means that a classifier is deployed in the network and the traffic is redirected through the fi firewall and the IPS to the web server. And if you do that only for port 80, only port, for port 80 traffic is redirected. If you need to do that, for example, for port 443, you could add a second service function chaining path with complete different elements in it. And you can do that without changing your application and the network attachment of the application. And that creates a lot of flexibility because if you deploy such a thing, you can have also an easy fallback. So, yeah, we have that. So then the next thing, yeah, scaling. You can also use scaling on the path of the service functions. So what happens if one IPS is not enough, or one firewall is not enough. Then you can use the port, uh, the port group chaining. You can place multiple VMs into one group, and then the traffic is redirected on the, or no, load balanced on the network level to these service functions. So there's no need for a load balancer. 
that you have to deploy on your application side. You just use what the network provides. But the network has to provide such service, such an SDN function to distribute traffic to different uh, service functions. Yeah. So um, continuing the, the theme I had started earlier in this physical to virtual migration, um, th this enables us to move away from those, those documents, the myriad of diagrams and spreadsheets and so forth, to machine-readable code. And this is sort of the, the vision that we're pursuing in terms of um, physical to virtual migration. We want all of these elements. So various par parts of OpenStack figure in very importantly here. We want a catalog of service function software as opposed to a order list of physical boxes. We want the network topology to be described in, in code and that is largely working out as YAML templates using, using heat and describing the physical topology as something that a, a computer can parse rather than a human being parsing a Word document to implement it. And the service function chaining is a, is a critical component of allowing us to do the policy-based routing and the, the create the complex network topologies that we see that we already are doing in the physical world and we're unable to do if, if all we had were simple networking constructs if all we had were flat networks or tenant networks behind a floating IP you can't build the kind of robust network topologies that we need in order to replicate what we have in the physical world in order to complete the physical to virtual migration. Okay, yeah. So to summarize the benefit of the new search chain solution, um, first is we can see it's low operational cost and high agility. So we do not need to do any advanced business planning anymore because this is replaced by real-time provision. Also, we do not need to manual configuration to do recabling, you know, all the network um, boxes uh, because this is replaced by automatic um, provision. And weeks of provision time is replaced by minutes of provision time. Another um, key is, uh, is application aware. Now you can go to the granularity of the application level. So even for the same tenants, tenant, different application flows can go through different service chain paths. And another is low capital expense. We do not need to allocate um, for peak time, peak capacity, because we can allocate resource as needed. And we have got requirement for this feature, you know, from pub <coughs> widely used to be <coughs> in public cloud, hybrid cloud, or wireless access to internet, that's like the GRLine scenario, and voice over IP and video conferencing. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's uh, some information about our uh, OpenStack Neutron service chain project. This is an officially approved um, Neutron project. So uh, it has a, 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 a public uh, repo called Networking Desk SFSG. So the codes has been uploaded to that um, uh, official repo. We started the work in Liberty Cycle. We're going to release in the M Cycle. Um, so we already implement codes. Uh, CRI, Horizon, Heat, yeah, all these codes for support the service function chain. We have also implemented codes on the Neutron server, which includes API, DB, Driver Manager, Common Driver API, and OVS Driver. We all have also implemented the OVS agent on the compute nodes. Maybe when I talk about this, you're a little bit confused on which module is which. So in the 5.30 session, we're going to have an architecture diagram which shows very clear what are the components and uh, how you can, you know, plug in different uh, uh, driver, um, to like different uh, SDN controller driver or, or just OVS driver to implement the, uh, the, the data path and the control plan. And here are some information links. Um, if you want to know more about this, you can go to, hit, to this link to get more information. We have um, weekly um, project meetings. You're welcome to join if you would like to know more. So now I'm going to do a demo of this new subchain uh, solution. So the demo will show three, three chains. The first chain is uh, for ICMP flow from this source to that destination. It's going to go through IDS service function and then a firewall service function. And the second chain is also for ICMP flow, but the source address uh, is different from the first flow. 
it will only go through uh, the IDS service function. The third chain will be for uh, HTTP traffic over TCP port 80. It will only go through the firewall service function. So let me let me go to the demo now. So this slide shows the topology of the first chain. So the traffic will originate from the source client VM. It will go and go to through the um, port, port group one, which consists of two IDS service VMs. And then it will go through the, let me turn on the speed to be a little bit faster. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's hard. Oh, why is it go too slow? That's why it's so slow. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and then it will go to the second port group, uh, which consists of one firewall VM, and it will reach the destination server VM. So we're going to turn on the TCP dump on the firewall console, so that if the traffic goes through the firewall VM, we will see some packet showing up on that window. We are going to turn on the snort console window on the IDS, so that when the traffic flow goes through IDS, uh, we are going to see package showing up on that window. This traffic will be uh, triggered by a ping command to the destination server VM from this source client VM. Now let's go to the, uh, to the uh, horizon gray. So we're going to first create a port pair for the IDS VM. We give it the name and description. And then we specify its ingress neutron port it's egress neutron port, and then we do create. So we see that this IDS port pair has been created for that service VM. Now we're going to create the second port pair for the second IDS service VM. Again, give it a description. We specify the uh, ingress neutron port. We specify its egress neutron port, and then we do the create. So we see that this second IDS um, support pair has been created. Now we're going to create a port pair for the firewall service VM. So we give it name, description, specify its ingress port and egress neutron port. So we see this firewall port pair is, is created. Now we're going to create the port pair group. We're going to group the service function together. So first we create the port pair group for IDS. So we get a, give it a description. Then we're going to put the IDS1 into this port group and IDS2 also put it into this IDS port pair group. So now we see this port pair group is created with two IDS uh, port pairs. Now we're going to create the second port pair group, which is for the firewall port pair group. So give it name, description. We're going to put firewall one port pair into this port pair group. So only one instance for this port pair group. Yeah, each port pair group can be one or more uh, service function instances. Now we see two port, uh, this firewall firewall port pair group has been created too. Now we're going to create the flow classifier. So we create the first flow classifier. We give it a description. It, it will be a pin traffic. Uh, it's an ICMP pin traffic from that source to that destination. So we specify its source address and destination IP address. So now we see that this flow classifier one is created. Now we're going to create um, the second, oh, now we're going to create the port chain. So we give it a name, port chain one, and then description. So we do create, we're going to specify the port pair group associated with this port chain. So IDS port pair group, and then firewall port pair group. And then we specify the flow classifier associated with the chain, which is the flow classifier one. So now we see that 
the port chain has been created with two port pair group, IDS and then firewall and then a flow classifier. So now this is a, a window. So this is client VM window, this server VM window, this is IDS service VM window, and this is a firewall service VM window. Now we're going to um, pin, uh, the traffic will, will trigger by the pin command from the uh, client VM to the destination server VM. So we see this pin uh, command. And then we see the traffic showing up on the IDS service VM window. And also sh the, the traffic flow also show up on the firewall service VM window. Now we're going to stop this pin. So we see that 24 packets has been transmitted and received. And then we see that this is a pin to the destination server VM. And then we see that this packet flow, it goes through this IDS service VM. We also see that this packet flow goes through the firewall service VM. Yeah, here it shows this packet. Now this is a second um, port chain. So again, this will originate from another client VM. So we, we can see the source IP address is different from the previous flow. Go through the IDS port pair group, we'll skip the firewall, and then go to server VM. So only go to IDS service VM, uh, this, this chain. We're going to again turn on TCP dump on the firewall VM, and then we're going to turn on the snort on the uh, console output on the IDS uh, service VM. Uh, the packet will be triggered by a ping command to that d server destination VM from this source client VM. So here we're going to create a new flow class file for this second port chain. Yeah, give it name and description. And then this will be, again, it's also the ICMB flow. Uh, we specify its source address. This source address is different from the uh, first chain's uh, flow source address. So we create this flow classifier. Now we see that the second flow classifier is created. Now we're going to create the chain. So this we are going to create the second port chain. We're going to put the firewall, the IDS, sorry, the IDS port pair group into this port. Uh, port chain. We're going to put the second flow classifier associated with this port chain. So we see that the second chain uh, port chain is created with only IDS um, uh, port pair group. Again, this is a client VM window. This is source client VM window, destination server VM window, IDS service VM window, and then firewall service VM window and the traffic will be triggered by the ping command from to the destination server VM from uh, a new client uh, VM. Now we see that this traffic uh, shows up only on the IDS service VM window. Now we're going to stop this um, ping command. We see the packets, 23 packets has been transmitted and received. Yeah, this packet is go to the destination server VM. And we see on the IDS service VM window, we see this packet there, so it goes through this. And we didn't, we didn't see any packet showing up on the firewall service VM, which means the traffic flow does not go through the firewall, just as the API specified. So this is sixth third port chain, the last port chain we're going to show again. It's going to go, th so this time it's going to go through the firewall service VM. It will skip the IDS service VM. And this is will be uh, HTTP traffic. We're going to turn on HTTP server on the server VM. Again, we turn TCP down on the firewall VM and snort console output on the IDS uh, service VM. And the traffic will be triggered by wget command to that HTTP server. Now we're going to create a third classifier associated with this third chain. 
So it's give it a description. It's a HTTP traffic over a TCP uh, channel. Um, give it the source address, destination address. And, and then we give it uh, the, the port, the TCP port is 80. So now we see that the third flow classifier has been created. Now we're going to create the third port chain. We're going to put the flow um, port pair group into this port chain and then flow class file three into this port associated with this port chain. So now we see that the third port chain has been created with file war port pair group and the flow class file associated with it. Same as before, client VM window, server VM window. On the server VM window, we're going to turn on the uh, HTTP server. And then this is idea service VM window, and this is a file world service VM window. And we're going to trigger the traffic through a wget command on the source client VM. So this wget command is go to the uh, destination server VM. So we see that the, tra the server received this HTTP traffic. And also we saw this traffic shows on, on the file world service VM. There's nothing showing up on the idea service VM, which means the flow only goes through the file world service VM. It doesn't go through the idea service VM, just as specified by the API. Yeah. So we're going to um, do a wget command again, same thing. Yeah. We see that all these showing up. That's it. <laughs> so now we're open. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> now we're open to questions. I hope we have time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are you attached the service to the service to the uh, port uh, strategy gradient? So in other words, is there a, a, a virtual machine running the firewall service or a virtual machine running the IDA service? Um, yeah, what's your question? How do I test? How do we test? Oh. So, Kathy, uh, if I could repeat the question okay. because I, I'm not sure it'll show up on the recording. Uh -huh. So the, the question is how do we attach the service functions to the chains? And what was done there, uh, you, you may not have quite got it from the, the description, was we're attaching neutron ports to the chain. So the service function would be a VM with either one or two ports. The ingress and egress port can be the same if the service function supports that. But in the in this typical scenario, if, if we might have a service function that has an ingress port and an egress port, so you would you would create that through Nova, through your heat template, whatever. You create the VM, you get back two neutron port IDs, and then you pass those two neutron port IDs in the correct order to the the service chaining API. That way, the the SFC knows what port to send the traffic into and what port to send it out of. And there, it's, it's, all, it's all neutron ports representing VM interfaces. Yeah. OK. So you have this interface model about the port pairs and uh, the service VM. So what if it is a load balancer? You have inbound is one and it's outbound is five. It's uh, outbound is what? Five, five outbound, but inbound is one. It's not a pair. Oh, so, um, so for that one, right? You, um, you say it's outbound. It's multiple. multiple yeah. um, so let me repeat. See. Let me repeat the yeah. question again. Okay. So, so the, the question is, what, what if the if you have a service function with one inbound port and and multiple outbound ports? So, my my question back to you: We're talking about neutron ports representing VNICs. Are you talking about a load balancer where it actually has ETH two, ETH three, ETH four, and it'll send traffic out? Um, different ports? I, I think the short answer is we haven't really considered that use um, case. I, I think, you know, the, okay, <laughs> let me take that question. So the thing is, that if you think load balancer is one of the service function, right? So the load balancer, how it distribute the traffic for, for to different uh, uh, its downstream, like, you know, uh, application, right? That thing is uh, internal to the load balancer. 
we are going to think of a model the load balancer plus its, uh, its downstream entities all together as a whole. As a whole, you space the in into the load balancer. It balances you know, to what, whichever application, right? That's internal. And then it has, when it goes out, so that out port will be the out neutron port. And then it goes to the next service function. So in our model, right, the load balance of the ingress port will be this ing uh, the ingress neutron port. And then the egress will be the, the, the port that exit the load balancer goes to the next, uh, uh, connecting to the switch. Uh, the, the load balancer connection to all these different applications, that's internal, transparent, yeah. Actually, this, uh, this problem has been discussed in the IETF uh, uh, community, so, okay. Okay, sure. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. The flow classifier, is it, is it running in a distributed manner or is it uh, is it a function that is applied on the service to you or somewhere? Or oh, okay. Good, uh, good question. So it could be two ways. You can centralize it in our reference implementation. It's distributed because we do not know their situations, right? For example, if we specify the flow comes from a neutron port, then we know where it is located, right? But if you space at the flow classifier as a five tuple, we don't know where the traffic will come from. So it's distributed. Yeah, we implement actually in the for the reference implementation implement in the OVS. But in the but that's implementation, right? You can implement as a, a centralized. But if you implement central, you have to really know that traffic will really go through that centralized place. Like for in the GLN scenario, you know. There's a P PGW, so you can implement there. But for some, like in data center, sometimes, you know, east-west traffic, it could be originated anywhere. Okay. This lady. Like insert a new service function? For example, yeah. I'm not talking about changing the chain, but according to what potential traffic is being performed up and should we train one chain or another? Okay. Okay, I'll take that. So first question. Oh, repeat the question. Okay. So the question is about, you know, um, in the course, there's an initiative of using a, a flow classifier, right? And we here in this uh, part, we implemented the flow classifier. Is there any plan we put this back to like a neutron core? That's a very good question. Yes, we have planned to do that because we actually have discussed this, you know. We are going to, uh, you know, to actually it's already very comprehensive, but we can evolve to make it common, will be, could, could be used by service function chain, by calls, or by any other feature. There, yeah. there is a, a spec review for what's called the common classifier. Right. And it's, yes, it, it, we, yes, it, it, it hasn't happened yet, but a absolutely, there, there is an intent that, that these various different um, functions that need to classify flows, that those should be consolidated. It's yeah. just from a time frame perspective, this project implemented it, QoS implemented, but yes. Yeah, so that's why we put that flow classifier as a separate plugin, which is very independent from service chain. So it's very independent. You can just port over. Oh, I'm sorry, second question. So second question is about whether we uh, can dynamically um, uh, oh, change the chain path based on the service functions processing result, right? Yes. So that's why, yeah, it's supported, although we haven't implemented yet. Um, how to support it is, you know, the service function, right, when it has processing some result, can through feedback through the metadata. So that brings up another topic we need to support a new service chain header, which is defined in IETF. And then, you know, we can, you know, have dif defined different types of metadata. That's, for example, for firewall, right? The firewall can feedback, say, after a few packets, you process a few packets, it can say, you don't need to send all the packets to me again, you know, it's already passed, right? So it can just bypass this um, firewall. So it can send back, you know, through the uh, either metadata or through uh, a bypass bit, which is defined in the IETF uh, draft, that we're working on that draft too.
So it can. Uh, it's a lot of you know um, rich functionality that can be enabled through this metadata parsing mechanism. Yeah. It, it's important to note this is an initial release. That this is. I mean, it'll really be in the Metaka time frame that this is, this becomes something you, you. I don't think you would want to deploy it right now. In fact, uh, Kathy referenced that all all this code being in the repo. Not all of it has merged yet. So when we say it's in the repo, it, <laughs> right, it's on yeah. review.openstack.org. Not all of the pieces of it have merged, although all the pieces of it are open for review. So if you yeah. do have specific code comments, um, the, the, uh, <laughs> the reviews are still, many of the reviews are still open. Some of them have merged, but many yeah. is still open. But I would like to emphasize the API has, you know, considered all you know, the questions has placed, so that's why we have a service function parameter specification. You can extend it to include, you know, those new functionalities. But just because we don't have time to implement it yet, so we didn't uh, really define it yet. But in the, uh, so again, <laughs> in 5.30 talk, we're going to talk about, talk about the next roadmap. Yeah. Um, okay, so, this lady. <laughs> Flow policy. Right. Um, this is all new to me. It's so fairly easy. I know a little bit about open flow, and it seems to me that this is have some overlap here in terms of flow policy. Is that true, or is this is totally different? Here? This is so rich. I'm not sure what you mean by flow so policy. Open flow. Are you aware of open flow? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think this is uh, um, quite related to that, no. Because uh, in OpenFlow, right, the ONF, we have a L4S7 work group on survey chaining. I'm part of that group. I'm the author of that specification. So it's separate. Okay. I don't think. Uh, How would this, those two, between flow policy, in, you have flow policy in, in survey chain? Uh, no, we have flow classifier. Okay, so that's different. Yeah, that's different. Okay. Uh, Um, probably not, you know, because f open floor is more a southbound uh, API. So we have northbound neutron API and then translate to southbound to program the switches. That's open flow. So yeah, it's different. Okay, l last question. Um, maybe I think I'll take that gentleman because he has raised several times. <laughs> So, so the, que the question, to repeat the question was, can, can we classify on things other than IP address? And the oh, yeah, of yes. course. Yes, and the answer is yes. The mm -hmm. examples all showed classifying based on IP address. Um, the full list of, of what you can classify was visible, but possibly not easy to, to tell from, the, from, the, from back there in, in the back of the room. Um, whether it's a comprehensive list, we would, we would welcome feedback if there um, are things that we have not included as classification elements that you think need to be included. QoS flags are, are not one of them currently, so that's, that, that could be some, some feedback. But the intent of the flow classifier is to be able to classify on some combination of criteria and you don't have to specify them all. In the demo, you saw a bunch of fields in the Horizon dashboard were skipped over. That was because we weren't classifying on those things in that particular flow classifier. Yeah, I want to add, we have a, a classification up to L7 level. You can classify based on URL. Okay, but there I, could be some, you know, uh, I, I, I think they're kicking us out. Oh, yeah, I think, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs>